In a narration of Sahih Muslim, an authentic hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, while the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was on his deathbed and he was departing from this world, the Prophet ﷺ told the companions and left a message for the Ummah. And he said, Wa ahlu bayti, my family. fi ahli bayti. I beseech you, I ask you, in the name of God, for the sake of Allah, take care of my family. fi ahli bayti. A second time, he said, I ask you for the sake of Allah, please take care of my family. And a third time, once again, he said, I ask you, please, in the name of Allah, please look after my family. The Prophet ﷺ, he tells us in a prophetic tradition, an authentic narration, that Ahsanukum. أَحْسَنُكُمْ لِأَهْلِهِ خَيْرُكُمْ خَيْرُكُمْ لِأَهْلِهِ وَأَنَا خَيْرُكُمْ لِأَهْلِي That the best amongst you is the one who's the best to his family. And I am the best to my family. This was something the Prophet ﷺ did not just say. It wasn't a slogan that he used because it was good marketing, or it was great branding, or it was good for fundraising, or because it sounded politically correct. Or because it was a good thing, it was a good instrument to use in debating and arguing with other people. When he was on his deathbed leaving this world, he turned to his companions, he turned to his community, he left a message for all of eternity, and he said, please, I ask you in the name of Allah, take care of my family. He loved his family and he cherished his family. There's a hadith in which the Prophet wasallam, authentic narration. There was a man who lived a few homes down from the Prophet wasallam. The man was of Persian descent. He was from Persia. He was Farsi. And he used to make a type of broth that the Prophet wasallam, was very fond of. He liked it very much. It was different. Not what the Prophet ﷺ was accustomed to eating, and he enjoyed it. So one day the Prophet ﷺ saw him, and he said that, What is it, friend? You haven't made that food for me in a very long time. You know how you would tell your neighbor or your friend, What's going on, buddy? You haven't invited me over for some barbecue in a long time. He said, You haven't made that food for me in quite some time. So the man thought about it and he said, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa wants me to make something for him and he asks me for it? That's it. He went home, he got all the supplies and he started cooking. Now these were the early days of Medina and a lot of people didn't have a lot of wealth. The Sahaba were struggling so he wasn't able to make a lot. He was able to make just a little. And he comes over to the home of the Prophet ﷺ to his house, and he knocks on his door. The Prophet ﷺ that day was at the home of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, his beloved wife Aisha. He was at her home, and the man knocks on the door, and the Prophet ﷺ answers the door. Assalamu alaikum ya Rasulullah, wa alaikum as salam, ahlan wa sahlan, alaikum, what's going on? And the man says, I was able to make you some of that food that you are so fond of, if you could please come to my home and share it with me. The Prophet ﷺ says, here's the problem. I'd love to. I asked you for some earlier. I'd love to. But I have plans tonight. I have plans. Tonight, I'm spending time. I'm hanging out. I'm having dinner with Aisha. So I'm sorry, but I can't come. The man 
very disappointed. He wants the Prophet to come to his home and eat his food. He leaves. He comes back a little while later, knocks on the door. The Prophet answers the door again. Yes, what can I do for you? The man's like, can you please come over for just a little bit? Just a few minutes. Five minutes, ten minutes. Aisha, she, 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 she'll get to spend all the rest of the time with you. Just ten minutes. Come over, eat a little bit. It'll be a great blessing for me. The Prophet ﷺ said, tonight, I have plans with Aisha. This is her time. I can't. Thanks, but no thanks. The man leaves. He comes back a third time, and then he knocks again. The Prophet ﷺ opens the door again. It's him again, but he doesn't get angry. Yes, friend, how can I help you? He says, what if I invite both you and Aisha over? Both of y'all come on over. Is that okay? Now you would think the Prophet is going to say, yeah, great. No, no, he says, I have to ask Aisha. It's her time. I promised her this evening. And the Prophet ﷺ asks Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, would you like to go? She said, yeah, that'd be great. And so then he tells him, he says, okay, both of us will come. And they went there, they ate there, and then they came back home together. Now, why did I tell this story? Sounds like a pretty straightforward, basic, simple story. But think about how profound it is. It is Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And date night, time set aside only for his wife. No interruptions, no responsibilities, no obligations. Look how seriously he takes it. Because if you stand there and you announce to all of humanity, خيركم خيركم لأهلي, وأنا خيركم لأهلي, If you announce that to everyone, that the best amongst you is the one who's the best to his family, and I'm the best to my family, and then when you tell your spouse, because you're the messenger of Allah, you're the busiest human being of all time, and then you tell your spouse, tomorrow night, it's just us. We're going to have a nice, quiet, intimate dinner, just the two of us. And the second someone shows up, you're like, hey, okay, I got to go. I'll be right back, all right? Then that's not consistent with your message. That's how seriously he took it. That's what I mean by it's not rhetoric. It's not sloganeering. In the description, the, 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 the ta- description of this talk, it talks a little bit about how there are all these other isms and movements that are destroying the Muslim family. Allow me just a moment of brutal honesty. There are movements, there are forces, external things at work that are eroding and eating away at the institution of family. But do not blame your terrible family situation on some external movement. That's not how it works. You have a bad marriage because you are not good at being a husband or a wife. You fail with your children. Your children don't listen to you because you're not a good parent. And I'm not trying to like pick on people when I say that. May Allah protect all of our families. Say I mean. But this is the greatest trap of shaitan. This is the greatest trap of shaitan. I do something wrong, who can I blame? I do something wrong, who can I blame? I never spend any time with my kids, it's feminism. I never spend any time at home, liberalism. Liberalism is destroying our homes today. No, maybe the fact that you treat your home like a hotel, you treat your wife like the front desk person at a hotel, you treat your children like they're the hotel staff, maybe that has a little bit of, about to do with why your family is struggling. Did you ever think about that? And look at all these stories from the life of the Prophet the, the most, Some of the most beautiful stories where the Prophet races with Aisha. Where he goes home after receiving revelation and holds the hand of Khadija while he's shaking and shivering and saying, what am I going to do, ya Khadija? What am I going to do? When he's standing there and Aisha wants to watch 
The visiting Abyssinians do their like display of skills and arts. And she stands behind him. And she puts her face next to his face right here, cheek to cheek, and stands there and watches. When he gets invited to go eat at his neighbor's house, and he says, I'm sorry, I'm having dinner with my wife. When he is giving khutbah on Friday, jum, khutbah tul jumu'ah, he's giving khutbah on Friday. And his son, his grandson, Hassan, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, was a little boy at that time. Little boy. And when little kids see grandpa, right? When they see their grandfather, when they see pappy, when they see him, they don't understand what's going on or not going on. They don't even care what's going on or not going on. They just see his grandpa. So he sees his grandfather and he gets excited. He runs up to the Prophet ﷺ while the Prophet ﷺ is giving khutbah. And, the Prophet, and he holds his arms out. Because he wants to be picked up. So the Prophet ﷺ pauses the khutbah, steps down from the mimbar, he picks him up, and he hugs him and he kisses him. And then he turns to the masjid that is full of people, and he says, Inna bani hadha sayyid. This boy of mine, this son of mine, he's a leader. And then the kid... Hassan radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he's a child, he wants to be put back down, he puts him back down and he runs off. And then the Prophet goes back up on the mimbar and continues the khutbah. When the Prophet wasalam, is praying salah at home, and he's watching, he's babysitting his grandsons, Hassan and Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhumah. And they climb onto the back, they climb onto his back when he's in sujood. And he doesn't get up so that they don't fall. They're little boys. And so they climb onto his back and he stays in sajda longer for a few extra minutes until they finally get off so that they don't fall. In salah, when you're talking to God, when you're praying to Allah, but he's considerate of the fact that his grandkids, his sons, are climbing on his back. Like all of these stories, in which of these stories... Does it talk about the Prophet ﷺ is giving them something? Is he giving them things? Is he buying them nice things? Clothes and shoes? Phones and computers? Cars and stuff? Is he buying them things? No. He's spending quality time with them. He's sharing experiences with them. He's interacting with them. That's what he's doing. A lot of times we use as an excuse for not spending quality time with our own family members, whether it be our elderly parents, or it be our spouses, or it be our children. A lot of times the excuse that we have is, well, we're trying to provide for them. We're trying to make sure that they have a good life. They have a nice home. They go to a private school. They have nice clothes, nice shoes, nice stuff. They get to go to the nicest colleges and universities. And then there's nothing wrong with all of that. But note this much. If you sacrifice knowing them, spending time with them, having experiences with them, sharing moments with them, for the sake of all of these things, these things will make no difference. These things do not ensure that you have a relationship with your family. If I pay my parents' bills, but I cannot make five minutes to sit down and talk to them, it's not worth anything. And your parents will tell you themselves, I don't care about these things. What I want is for you to spend some time with me. And that's the example of the Prophet ﷺ. All the narrations that you can find about the Prophet ﷺ demonstrate this fact. When Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ, when she used to come to visit the Prophet ﷺ, he used to get up, he would go and greet her at the door, he would hug her, he would kiss her, then he would hold her hand, and then he would walk back to where he was sitting and then he would sit down and make her sit next to him and he would hold her ear. he would hold her hand while he sat there 
That was his relationship with this baby girl, Fatima. One of the last people to have a personal, intimate conversation with the Prophet ﷺ was Fatima. When he was on his deathbed, the night before he passed away. And Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha came to see him. Aisha says, we were all gathered around. There was this ominous, you know, feeling in the room. Everyone was in tears. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he had his eyes closed because he was in so much pain and fever. And he opened his eyes and he looked at the door. And we all turned and we looked at what he was staring at. And it was Fatima. And then like the seas parted. And Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha came in. And Aisha says, if you ever saw Fatima in person, when she walked, when she talked, you knew immediately she was the daughter of the Prophet It was like you were looking at the Prophet And she came and she sat down next to the Prophet And she held his hand and she started to cry. Why does my father have to suffer? And he told her, Worry not, beloved daughter. After today, your father will suffer no more. And then he called her close and he whispered something into her ear. And she started to cry even more. And then he called her close again and he whispered her something into her ear a few minutes later. And she started to smile through her tears. And then she kissed his hand and kissed his forehead, bid him farewell and left. The next morning the Prophet would pass away. A few weeks later Aisha said, I waited. And then I asked Fatima, radiallahu ta'ala anha, Sayyida Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha, can you please tell me, do you mind sharing what, what he said? And she said that I had not dealt with the reality that he was going to be leaving. I couldn't. She lost her mom when she was young. She lost, you know, all three of her older sisters. He's all I had left. But she said that at that moment, he first whispered to me, he said, Fatima, I am in fact leaving. This is it. I've known since last Ramadan, when I reviewed the Quran, not once, but twice with Jibreel. I knew then. So I am going, Fatima. You need to be ready for this. And I started to cry. And then when he called me close again, he said, however, O Fatima, you will be the first of my family to come and join. We're all going to be together again soon. And she said, that's why I smiled. And six months, exactly six months to the day, the Prophet passed away. Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha, she got up, she took a ghusl, a bath of purification. She put on clean clothes. She lied down in her bed. She said the shahada, closed her eyes and passed away. But this was a relationship that they had. It wasn't built or predicated on things. It was built on the time, the experiences, the moments, the conversations that they shared together. That's our deen. This, this what I'm saying, this message right here, very much could sound like it's coming from a family therapist or a counselor. They would probably say the same thing. But this is our deen. This is not me trying to fit something into the deen that does not belong from the deen. I'm quoting to you hadith after hadith after hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. This is our religion. This is the fiqh of family. That this is how it's done. And I want to say again, with something I touched upon earlier, the real enemy is always internal, not external. Your nafs is harder to defeat than shaitan is. And shaitan is harder to overcome than anybody else. But your nafs is harder to defeat than even shaitan. Our own internal demons, our own internal problems. Our negligence is the real destroyer of families in our communities. And all the other isms, all the other movements, the liberalism and the whatever else that's going on today. That's fine. It is problematic. I agree. It is problematic. But let's not delude ourselves by looking for someone to pin the blame on. No, no, no. We are our own enemy at times. We have to take responsibility. We will have better homes. We will have better families. We will stop talking about the Prophet ﷺ and his life like it's just a slogan.
We're st- going to stop using this dean for marketing and advertising and campaigning. Live it. Live it. And we're going to start implementing the life of the Prophet ﷺ in our lives, in our families, and in our homes, in our communities, and in our societies. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve and protect all of our families. Say ameen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to build good, strong homes and families. May those who have families, may Allah keep them together. Those who have been separated by their, from their families, may Allah reunite them. Those who are by themselves, may Allah grant them loved ones and family. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reunite all of us together in Jannat al-Firdaus al-A'la, in the company of the Prophet and his family. Jazakumullah khairan wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah.